This is a Fox 54 special presentation. Sports Extra, a look at SWAC 2022. Now your hosts, Mo Carter and Simon Williams. And good evening, everyone. I'm Mo Carter. Simon Williams will join us very soon. We appreciate you joining us for our Sports Extra special, a look at SWAC in 2022. For the next 30 minutes, we'll provide an early look at what to expect in the 2022 season with the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Keep in mind, it's only 30 minutes, so we can't cover every story or every school, but we'll give you enough to salivate on. Let's start off right on the hill. Now, over the past few years, Four in particular, Connell Manor and the Alabama A&M Bulldogs, they relied on the strong arm of the guy throwing the passes right here, and that is a quill glass. Of course, he's a two-time Deacon Jones HBCU Player of the Year, and he officially moved on from the hill at the end of the 2021 season. So this year, Alabama A&M's offense will have a new identity. Simon Williams has more on that unit. The most dire need for this Alabama A&M team is replacing Akil Glass, who finished fourth on the SWAC's all-time career passing list. However, they do return three all-SWAC preseason offensive players in running back Gary Quarles, receiver Abdul Fatai Ibrahim, and lineman Carson Vinson. But they know that production from their signal caller can make or break the season. Offensive coordinator Dwayne Taylor said it's always difficult to replace a great player, but it's up to those still on the roster to meet that challenge. You know, as we tell our guys, uh, we don't coach number twos. You're number one in weight. So those guys have uh, been waiting for their moment. They just got to take advantage of that moment and make their opportunity the best. Head coach Connell Maynard revealed it's a two-man competition between redshirt freshman Quincy Casey and junior Xavier Lankford. Now right now, it's still Quincy and uh, Xavier uh, battling out. And uh, still a tight battle. Uh, we would like for both of them to play a little bit better than they're playing right now. Somebody got to step up and take the job. Maynard was up front saying that there is improvement needed from both players in order to determine who's most deserving of the starting role. But at the end of the day, the quarterback job is to make good decisions and not take losses, uh, throw the ball away when you have to, don't force it. Uh, his job is to make everybody better, make the receivers better, make the O-line better by changing up the cadence, uh, put the ball on the receivers, give them yak yards, things of that nature. And so right now they're not doing that, uh, but they'll get there. Both Casey and Langford are inexperienced in terms of game reps, as the two only have a combined 15 attempted passes in their career with the Bulldogs. But Casey did actually start one game during the spring 2021 season when he was at Jackson State. Ironically, it was against Alabama A&M when he threw for 323 yards and four touchdowns. What may ease the transition for whoever becomes the starter is built-in experience at running back, receiver, and especially the offensive line. Position you guys have at least 20 games under your belt. Now we're going to play through you. So the offensive line has to dominate up front, make the line calls, give us holes to run through, so our quarterbacks can get comfortable. Coach Maynor hopes to have the starter named by Saturday the 20th when the Bulldogs play a full scrimmage as part of their Fan Day event. Their kickoff for real is on Thursday, September 1st, on the road at UAB. Mo, back over to you. All right, thank you, Simon. On Halloween weekend, Connell Manor will try to keep a perfect record in Birmingham as the team squares off with arch rival Alabama State and the Magic City Classic. Following last year's Classic, the Hornets parting ways with Donald Hill Ely and brought in one of the greatest players in the history of their program, Eddie Robinson Jr. He takes over the reins as the head coach of the Hornets. The New Orleans native coming to Montgomery in the late 80s, and when he left, he was the 1991 SWAC Defensive Player of the Year. This is Robinson's first stint as a head coach, but he's been around college football since retiring from the NFL, working as an HBCU college football analyst for ESPN, the SWAC, and the school's radio station with yours truly in the mid-2010s. Coach Robinson says the Hornets should be ready to compete. I think if you look at all the teams on the schedule and the games that we lost last year, I don't think and we were dominated by any team. So I think uh, our, our fans and our, co I mean, our coaches and mainly our players, you know, they feel like that they can compete with all the teams in the conference. And so, uh, you know, we'll take our lumps. We're going to go out there and play hard. We think we're going to have a good game plan in place, uh, have a good group of kids. And, and the biggest thing is that the kids have confidence in themselves that we can have a good team. And, and once they believe it, then after that it's downhill. Coach Robinson did a lot of recruiting in the offseason, and one of the biggest names was Demetrius Davis, the Houston native spending two seasons at Auburn as a backup quarterback. Now he moves 45 minutes up I-85 to lead a Hornets offense that finished near the bottom of the swag in total offensive production. Coach Robinson has known Davis for a few years from their days in Houston and uh, knows what he's capable of doing. 
I mean, he's a true dual threat guy, and then he's a winner. I mean, the guy's a competitor. He knows how to compete. Uh, so I think, you know, that quarterback position, I, I, don't, I don't see him where he has to be the leader of the whole team or leader of the offense. He's a part of the puzzle. But I think his athletic ability and his confidence level will definitely transcend to throughout the team. Jackson State taking home the SWAT crown last season, so can they do it again in 2022? Or will it be another strong program in the SWAT? We'll take a look at the contenders in the conference next. The road to earning a spot in the SWAC title game for Alabama A&M or Alabama State is long, rugged, and challenging, primarily because of the teams that the Bulldogs and Hornets will have to go through. Last season, Coach Deion Sanders in Jackson State ran through the SWAC East with an unbeaten record. The head coach of the JSU Tigers has a slew of great talent returning on this squad in 2022, especially at the skill positions. The Tigers have the potential to run through the East again, but according to Sanders, it won't be easy. All these guys are tough. It's not just a division. Everybody that's on that schedule is tough. It is. It really is. I love this conference. Um, I love what SWAC brings to the table. You, you got to play every week. There's no games on the schedule that's a gimme that you know you're going to just roll over someone. It's not like that. In their first year as a member of the SWAC, the Florida a and Rattlers finished second to Jackson State uh, with one point making the difference. Willie Simmons and his staff have a strong nucleus returning, including several all-conference standouts on defense. Coach Simmons and the Rattlers are hoping to avenge last year's loss to Jackson State in week one at the Orange Blossom Classic. Unfortunately, a team will have to leave the game 0-1, right? But every team that plays conference play will have that same dilemma. Uh, for us, it just, it's just week one. And, and so, but again, it's an exciting opportunity to go down there and play again. And we can't wait to get down because we feel like we have some unfinished business. Over in the wild, wild west, Southern University is the preseason favorite to win the division. The Jags are led by Eric Dooley, a longtime former Southern assistant coach who's had success at UAPB, Grambling State, and most recently, Prairie View as the head coach. And when I first came back here, I know we had to address the needs, but I wanted to build it inside out. When I meant inside out, I wanted to build an offense and a defensive line. I think uh, in order to be a championship football team, you got to be strong in that area. The Jags will have a target on their back as big-time rivals Alcorn State and Grambling State seek to take that top spot. Now, although the Alabama a and Bulldogs did not possess the worst defense overall in the swag, that unit was a liability in many situations during the past few seasons. There was an overhaul in the offseason, and now that unit is starting from scratch. Here's Simon Williams with more. Connell Maynard elevated Kiana's bullwear from defensive tackles coach to defensive coordinator, hoping to improve on last year's defense, one which finished 107th nationally out of 123 teams in points allowed at 37.9. Among SWAC foes, they weren't much better either, allowing nearly 426 total yards per game. It's fourth worst in the league. And so far, it's been mixed results, says Bullwear. In the Bulldogs' first intra-squad scrimmage, the defense allowed six touchdowns in the two-hour game simulation. And although AM has some good skill players on offense, Bullwear still wasn't pleased. Well, like I say, giving up six scores out of 101 plays, you know, that's, that's demoralizing for me. Um, but at the same time, when you look across the ball and you see those veteran guys, we got a three-time All-American that wasn't practicing today. So if you add him to the mix, you're looking at even more touchdowns than that possible because um, we got some very, very tough guys on our offense. Among those who've stood out to Bullwear include Avion Rice, a freshman from Fort Myers, Florida. The six-footer can play practically every defensive back position and boasts an explosive highlight reel. Rated as a three-star prospect by 247 Sports, Rice picked A&M over Miami, West Virginia, Maryland, and others in the Power Five conferences. According to Max Preps, he collected over 200 tackles in his high school career. Um, this guy, he made probably about five plays in a row during a stretch of practice to where a lot of these guys were kind of getting winded and tired, but he's just standing tall. So we knew we had something in him, but we didn't expect that type of explosion out of a freshman. Rice's position as a linebacker, which is where recruiting sites list him, or safety, like AM has him down for, might be an example of AM's evolving defensive scheme as a whole. While Bullware says it's, quote, still early to say with certainty what their scheme is, he has noticed some distinguishing features. We're probably doing a little bit more 
man coverage than we, that I'm accustomed to, um, but I think we got the cornerbacks to hold up on the back end that will allow us to put more pressure on the quarterbacks. But the thing is, we got to get better at our blitz game unless we play in a lot of zones. So right now it's kind of one of those, let's get it on film, take a look at it, and at this point in time of the season, uh, still early, let's find out what we like, what we don't like, and then come a little bit closer to what our true identity is going to be. With new coaches and new roles comes tweak to game plans, but equally as important are the personnel brought in to execute it. 30 of the 38 players brought in as part of this year's signing class play defense, and a lot of the transfers who are part of that class have been on campus since the spring semester. As a line coach by trade, Bullware was sure to mention the line of scrimmage, saying everyone's doing a good job up front. We're just still working on chemistry every day. Every day is it's, it's an opportunity for us to learn what we're doing a little bit better, a little bit better. This new look A&M defense will get tested right away when they play UAB in the season opener, as well as the SWAC opener in week four when they visit Florida A&M, a top 25 FCS scoring offense from last year. Mo, back to you. Thanks, Simon. Since 2018, the SWAC has been on the rise. The conference has gained a host of new sponsorships, had more nationally televised games than ever before in all sports, and revenue for the conference is also at its highest in 100-plus years of the league. Now, the man pulling the trigger with the deals via his signature is Commissioner Dr. Charles McClellan. Yeah, well, we are as strong now as we've ever been. We had a record distribution to our schools. Uh, we have a robust reserve. We were able to pay off our 30-year note on the building in two years, so we actually uh, own the building. And with the addition of our corporate partners, uh, we're in the top three as far as overall revenue in FCS. And with the growth of the conference, both physically and financially, Dr. Charles McClellan and his executive committee have began talks about eventually moving up to the FBS level for football. But it's a long, drawn-out process that will take additional time. So as a group, we think that if there is going to be a move to FBS, it should be done as one unified group. But you have to have the wherewithal to do so. And part of that wherewithal is getting the legislation done within the NCAA. Right now, there is no path legislatively to get that done, but we're going to work on that as well. Still a long-range goal. McClellan has been around the SWAC his entire life, so he truly understands what it means to see the conference prosper. Under his watch, he plans to carry the conference to even higher heights. So we stand on our tradition, we stand on our history, and we will continue to stand on that because that makes us who we are. We're not going to run away from the fact that we are an HBCU lead. That's what makes us special, and that is what made us be here for 101 years, and that is what's going to make us be here for the next 101 years. There's more coming up on our SWAC preview show. Up next, Darian Gray from our good friends at the Locked On Podcast Network sits down to give us his take for the upcoming season. Stay tuned. And welcome back to our Sports Extra Special, a look at SWAC in 2022. Of course, there's a lot of individuals who will be covering the football teams across the Southeastern football print within the SWAC. And one of those is our very own Darian Gray. For those that don't know, he is the host of the Locked On Podcast Network for HBCUs. If you've been paying attention, you've seen me on this show quite a few times. Darian, we don't have that much time with it, so we're just going to jump straight into it. Can anyone dethrone Jack? Jackson State to be the new SWAC champ in 2022. I'm looking at one team right now standing here on the middle of August 2022. I think there's only one team, in my opinion, that has a realistic shot that I can really put my money behind. And that's the FAMU Rattlers. They still have Isaiah Land. They still have BJ Bowler. They have a linebacker transfer that just came in that was looking pretty good during spring practice. This is a team that's not bad. They have some questions at the quarterback position, but they still have Xavier Smith. They still have John Murray Sheree, who's going to be one of the most fantastic and explosive players on special teams. This is a really good ball club, and people know that, and that's why the Orange Blossom Classic is being looked at as not only kind of the de facto SWAC East champion, but also kind of the de facto SWAC champion until somebody else steps in and, and can claim that they can compete. Look, I'm going to stay here in the Eastern Division of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Of course, I'm here in Huntsville, Alabama. It's an Alabama-based show for the most part. Um, 
you and I have been talking a little bit, but I'd just like to know, you know, what's your thoughts about what Alabama A&M uh, can do this year in the East? And do you think they could possibly rain on uh, the upset bug when it comes to either the Rattlers or the Tigers? Now look, look, look. Still go check out Locked on HBC, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I just don't see it right now. It's Here's the thing about Alabama A&M is I think they're going to be a good ball club. But I just have not heard much good or bad about their quarterback situation. They still got a, a really good running back. They still have a really good wide receiver. But I don't know what their quarterback is going to be. I don't have much confidence in it because I haven't heard good things about the battle. I'm not hearing bad things, but I haven't heard good things. And they replaced their whole defense. I think that Coach Maynard is a fine coach. And I do believe in him to get these guys together. But right now, a question mark, a huge question mark at the quarterback position and a question mark at the defense where you replace basically all of your players. That's too much for me to have confidence right now. So, of course, we've been talking about some of the beasts in the East, but let's head over to this wild, wild West. Obviously, my alma mater, Southern University, has Eric Dooley returning. There's a new coach in North Louisiana, in Hugh Jackson at Grambling State. And, of course, Coach Fred McNair and the Alcorn State Braves, I don't expect them to kind of stay down for long. So I want to ask you this, my man, since, especially since you're based more in the Western portion of the division, do you think any one of those three teams can possibly run the table or do you think it could be someone else? No, but I don't think anybody in the West is running the table. So I don't think we're going to have any undefeated teams. I think that wild, as you described it two times, see wild, wild West is a perfect description of this conference. We have to understand that before last year, Southern, Grambling, all corn these are mainstays and not only competitive but these are mainstays in the swac championship all corn was winning the east year after year after year grambling and southern were going back and forth for the west year after year after year and now they're all three in the same division this is going to be very interesting i think that all three of these teams have a chance i know it seemed like the bayou classic for years was the de facto swac west championship but we have to remember there's a question mark in all corner. It's a question mark at quarterback, a lot of teams or a lot of teams in the SWAC. But we have to remember that Felix Harper, he took over for a SWAC player of the year and then he became a SWAC player of the year. Fred McNair knows how to develop quarterbacks and that's something that cannot be underrated. I expect these to be the three top teams in the West. How they fall out, it could go any kind of way, but I will say this, there's a team that I feel like is not getting a lot of love in Grambling. They were fourth in the rankings underneath these two and Prairie View. This is my dark horse team. If Kajaya Holloway is good like we thought he would be coming out of high school when he went to UCLA, they have Ryan Peppins, Tyson Bordeaux, they have Pajon Wilson. They have some really good talent at the wide receiver positions. They could really shake some things up and make some noise in a way that clearly the SWAT coaches don't think that they will. And also, of course, you're in uh, the Houston area, and I know there's a lot of people that are very, very high on one Andrew Body. Alabama and them fans here remember the shootout that he had last year against a Quill Glass, in which it almost seemed like whoever was going to get the ball last was going to win the game. And surprisingly, the one of the few times the AM defense comes up, they actually were able to get a stop against Body and company. But when we talked to him at Swag Media Day, it seems like this guy has a chip on his shoulder. What do you think the ceiling is for a man like that? Swag Player of the Year, period. That is the ceiling for Andrew Body. He has that talent. We give it to Shadur Sanders because we've seen what he's done. He was the second team all Swag quarterback, but let's not be confused. Let's not understate it. Andrew Body is a supremely talented quarterback he was one of the best rushers in the conference in addition to being one of the best passers in the conference i'm not just saying quarterback we're separating both sides of that game and he excelled at both as a freshman i've heard him speak about how that second year it just clicks for him he has some more under his belt he'll be still running with those same triumvirate of running backs that he had last year he's still coming back with a strong offensive line there might be some question marks in he lost some of his receiving threats but Jiren Johnson has performed well during spring practice 
this is a guy who has a lot of pressure on him more so than a lot of quarterbacks in the league his own court his own coach excuse me says that we're going to go as far as andrew body takes them and i agree we'll be keeping all eyes and i'll be at a bunch of texas southern games so i will be able to keep you posted on how body looks this year and we'll wrap things up in something of a Texas Southern related fashion. The current commissioner of the SWAC, Dr. Charles McClellan, his previous job was AD of Texas Southern. And we've seen that he's been successful at every place he's basically been at. What do you think about the job that he's been able to do when it comes to elevating the conference to where it is now compared to when he actually found it in the place that he received it? I love the mind and the vision of Dr. McClellan. I do. When I look at expanding to FAMU and Bethune-Cookman. These were great grabs. You know, it just so happened that, that FAMU was one of the best teams in, in the SWAC this year, right? And that's somebody that they brought in their first year. They've been successful in other sports. We focus on football, right? Because that's the, that's the money sport. FAMU had the basketball player of the year in MJ Randolph. This was a good addition to the conference. We're looking at the partnership with HBCU Go. We're uh, looking at the recent position that he gained as a chair within the NCAA um, and just dealing with basketball. This is going to bring a lot of attention to the SWAC. So you're looking at him in a high profile position. You're looking at the deal with HBCU Go that is going to expand the view and the visibility of the conference. And we're also talking about expanding the conference and that doesn't even mention the idea of the whole conference moving to an FBS level. And I think that's a 10 year plan. So that's not something that we should expect tomorrow. <laughs> However, it tells you that not only has he done well in the past, his vision is still heading forward. And that's what you want when talking about the leadership of a conference. Hey, we want to thank you once again, Darian. Uh, he's a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. And of course, we've got that partnership with all the stations within the Tegna brand. Hey, stay tuned. We've got uh, more here on our SWAC football preview. Matter of fact, when we return, we'll take a look at some of the key games for the upcoming season that could determine a champion in the month of December. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Before we wrap up our 2022 SWAC preseason special, let's take a look at some key games this upcoming season. SWAC fans will invade Atlanta this year for another MEAC SWAC challenge as Alabama State takes on Howard. Avery Robertson Jr. is trying to get off to a good start at his alma mater. In week one, we'll head to Florida where Jackson State and Florida A&M go head-to-head -head in the Orange Blossom Classic. This game turned out to be a de facto East Division crown last year. Also in week one, Alabama A&M travels down I-65 to take on UAB in their opener. On September the 17th, a pair of cross-division games uh, features battles between rivals. Jackson State plays host to Grambling in a non-conference affair, while Southern takes on Texas Southern in the Arlington Classic. One week later, the Bulldog Nation travels to Tallahassee to face Florida A&M in a key SWAC East matchup. Bulldogs blew an 18-point lead to the Rattlers in 2021. During the first week of October, Alabama A&M welcomes Bethune Cookman to Huntsville for the homecoming weekend. Hopefully the weather will be much better than last year. Another big matchup that evening will be in Dallas as Grambling and Prairie View A&M go head to head in the State Fair Classic. Halloween weekend could be a trick or treat for some teams. Connell Maynard and Eddie Robinson Jr. will score off in the Magic City Classic for the first time as foes. Also Southern travels to Jackson State for a potential SWAC title game preview and Alcorn State travels to Grambling. Nationally televised games are marquee on November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Alabama A&M will travel to Mississippi Valley that Thursday. Alcorn State takes on Prairie View A&M for about on Friday. Both games are on ESPNU. Southern will head to Tallahassee and face Florida A&M that weekend. The Gulf Coast Challenge highlights the weekend of November the 12th as Jackson State and Alabama A&M meet in Mobile. The Tigers whipped the Bulldogs last season and left behind a little gift. And rivalry games are on deck in late November. Florida A&M and Bethune Cookman meet in the annual Florida Classic, while Jackson State travels to the reservation to face Alcorn State. And then on Thanksgiving weekend, Southern and Grambling State fans make their way to New Orleans for the annual Bayou Classic to see Eric Dooley go head-to-head -head with Hugh Jackson. The SWAC champ will be crowned on December the 3rd, and that champ will face the MEAC champ at this year's Celebration Bowl in December. Thank you for joining us this evening. Have fun and be safe at the games this year.